That's right. Welcome in. Welcome back, folks. Notre Dame may be in the bye, but there's still a ton of action to talk about. You know my line if you've been around here. I always say there's never a dull moment in Notre Dame land. That certainly applies now, even though Notre Dame's on the break. There's news galore, and we're going to get into it. This is going to be a special episode today, kind of a a Notre Dame Fighting Irish brought to you by Sports Illustrated Roundtable of Sorts. We're going to bring in a couple guests, uh, uh, fellow writers on the website here, and we're going to shoot to all, spray to all fields and cover all the things going on in Notre Dame land while we have this little break. As always, you can find the program on YouTube. Do it. Subscribe if you haven't yet. Appreciate it very much. Give the video a thumbs up. That helps John out as well. Uh, be sure to go to the website, Notre Dame Fighting Irish by SI every day. Make a bookmark it. Go there. We got recruiting. We got breaking news. We got opinion pieces. We got a little bit of everything. So we thank everybody for being there. That being said, let's bring in our guest of the day. It is the managing editor of this website, Nick Chepkowski. And live from fabulous Las Vegas, it is new father, Nathan Erbach. What's going on, gentlemen? Thanks for joining me on the bye week. Yeah, happy to, John. Uh, it's not a live show, so I don't get the chat full of your your loyal listeners and subscribers that are asking, John, who's this guest? Who is this guy? He seems like he knows his stuff, but who the hell is he? It's like, oh, yeah, it's him. You know what bothered me, Nick? Our names were down here, but on that one episode, your name didn't show up in the little rectangle. That's why people were asking. I don't know what happened. So maybe (laughs) I dropped the ball on the in the control room here. Maybe people are going, "Who's this guy?" So maybe John dropped the ball. Maybe Mm -hmm. listen. You got hair like you're rocking today. We need to get you on the air more, Nick. You're looking sharp over there. I like that I little know. do you got, I man. Mean, I did it. I did it for the Brady Quinn interview, and it stuck around. So, oh, baby, that's some staying power. That's uh, that's good news. And then Nathan here, we're trying to squeeze this in between the the newborn baby's nap time, or what are we doing here in Vegas? Yeah, yeah. I almost I don't feel like a new father anymore, which is kind of funny to say because it's been about what six, almost two months. I feel like six weeks or so. Um, things are things are going steady though. Um, or we're, she's starting to sleep better at night, so I can't complain too much. Well, that's uh, it's obviously been a blessing. That once is very- it goes from once it goes from the getting up at least twice a night to usually just once, everyone's like, "Oh, when the baby's sleeping through the night, that's a difference maker." I'm like, no. When the baby only gets up once at night, that is the biggest change where you can learn to sleep on like two and a half, three hours. And you're like, okay, well, all right, I'm due. All right, I'm going to get another two and a half, three hours here. That's the biggest difference maker. Yeah. And I think we're sort of in that stage. So, which is, which is nice. Well, that's good, Nathan. And uh, glad everybody's healthy and that went well for you. Um, Congratulations there. And uh, so as we get into this, you guys, you know, Notre Dame's in the break. Um, Been a wild first five weeks, (laughs) obviously on the field. We'll get to that. Um, And so uh, this is a great time to be able to call timeout and take a look at where Notre Dame's at on the field, off the field, a lot of different areas, a lot of things to discuss. Let's start with the obvious because it is breaking news everybody's aware of after months and months of rumors and innuendo and speculation and social media BS and everything that goes with it. The deuce is officially loose. He has flipped his commitment to the upstanding citizen that is known as Hugh Freeze there at Auburn, uh, an upstanding gentleman I would want to play for. I know that. So flip to Auburn. I... I want to know how you guys feel about this because it's been in the works for a very, very long time. It's not a shock to anybody, albeit frustrating, not exactly a shock. Nathan, what do you make of this move? What is your initial reaction to it? Yeah, I mean, I'm honestly just kind of relieved it's over um, just because it's sort of, like you said, it was expected for a while. At least it felt like that. Notre Dame was obviously battling, trying to get him on campus for Stanford from all we've heard. And, you know, we thought might, that might happen and maybe they might be able to hold him off. But then again, it's like he gets on campus as a freshman, maybe doesn't play a whole lot. And then he ends up hitting the transfer portal. And I think obviously you want, you want to land talented athletes like that. I mean, that kid, I like if he, if he hits, he's number one 
QB potential in the draft type of type of player. I mean, the size, the the rushing ability, the arm strength, all that kind of stuff. So um, you you want to land those kids if you're Notre Dame, but there is some some sort of like I guess breath of fresh air that makes you think that okay, the next quarterback they land will at least stick it out for a few years to see if he could maybe be the guy. Um, or maybe even turn into the guy once, you know, hopefully CJ Carr's the starter for a couple of years or Kenny Minchie has a year or two and then Carr takes over from there. And then this kid might have a year or two after that. So, um, there's definitely some guys that I think that they're going to reach out to. Um, this is actually a really good 2025 recruiting class from a, from a quarterback perspective, which I think helps a lot too. So just cause you lose Deuce Knight, who's the number five guy in the class and a, you know, a five-star, um, or a potential five-star down the line. Um, you know, let's just say Notre Dame lands the 12th best quarterback in the class and they flip them from, you know, Maryland or North Carolina or something like that. Um, I think you're still getting a really, really talented player. And it kind of reminds me, honestly, of the Kenny Minchie recruitment when they lost out on Dante Moore. They didn't get Christopher Vizina. Um, you know, they didn't get a few other guys that might have been top targets on their board previously. Settled, not I wouldn't say they settled for Kenny Minchie, but they were able to get Kenny Minchie late in the process as a flip from Pittsburgh. Um, and you know, he was a top 150 player, and I and I wouldn't be surprised if that happens again. Nathan, what is the time frame like? Because this is interesting, this isn't a surprise to Notre Dame, they've had a while now to be able to wrestle with the reality that this may happen. So I'm imagining they've been working behind the scenes. Do you have any idea what the time frame would be to fill that spot? Or is this still very much a work in progress? Yeah, so they're keeping it pretty close to the vest. I haven't been able to find anything out specifically. Um, I know that there's some intriguing names out there that have been thrown around by, you know, like the Tom Loys of the world. And those guys obviously do a lot of good work um, in trying to find that kind of info out and, and getting the sources to find that info out. But um, Notre Dame is keeping it close to the best. And the feeling that I get just based on some of the conversations I've had and some of the stuff I've read is that a, they want to lock in on wh when they finally offer a kid, they want it to maybe be that one kid that they offer. And then that's the kid they end up flipping or, or getting in the class. They don't want to offer three or four guys, um, publicly per se. Um, and then, and then it turned into like, okay, who are they going to get? This kid ends up going from, you know, like, uh, I'll give you a good example. There's the kid, the kid committed to Cal right now, who was a, who's been a late riser. Um, I don't want to butcher his name. I'll just call him uh, JKS because he's a, he's a poly kid from Hawaii. Like I said, committed to Cal, Oregon just offered. And Oregon has a quarterback commit already in the class as well, but clearly they're in on this kid. There's been some rumors that Notre Dame might be in on him as well, but let's just say he's on the verge of flipping to Oregon currently and Notre Dame that won't really gain any traction there. What's the point of having a public offer out there and then just disappointing fans even further and making it kind of like a, I guess a, a crap show for all, for all intent and purposes. Right. So um, who knows now, if they do offer that kid, then I would say that there's probably a pretty good chance that he's at least going to visit for something. And, and I think that's where Notre Dame's at right now. When they finally do offer a kid or two, um, or a recruit or two, that's going to be someone that they get on campus and they have a really good shot at landing. Interesting. Uh, Nick, what do you make of this whole deuce dynamic? You know, I think about this because you and I were at Notre Dame the beginning of August for the media event. And the day of that, I pulled into the driveway. You and I had a great day at Notre Dame. The energy was high. We were all excited. And I pull in the driveway and I open my phone and I have 50 text messages with all this deuce news. And it was like, <laughs> it was just all bad being like, this is imminent. And, and it just resonated with me that we had that great day at Notre Dame and the vibes were great. And then the second I pull in the driveway, that hit. What is your reaction to this? I mean, yeah, it's not often you get a 6'4", 6'5", kid that's built like a brick bleep house that is – you know, <laughs> going to come play quarterback, especially when it's from the state of Mississippi, right in the heart of SEC country. And the talent speaks for itself. But a lot of that's potential talent. A lot of that, I don't know, there's this thought that Deuce Knight walks on campus at Notre Dame and from day one, he's a savior. And it's like, well, Deuce Knight could be the commit and could walk onto campus next year. It's not like he was going to start next year. It's not like that was a realistic possibility. And I look at it and it's then you kind of go through just just historically. And I did a piece for the site on this where you just look at, all right, where are those kind of fifth overall quarterbacks, according to 24-7 sports rankings, 
where have those played out? And there's a couple that are big hits in there. Um, there's a few like Trevor Simeon from uh, Northwestern, I believe, was a number five overall quarterback in there. Dwayne Haskins from Ohio State was in there. And oh, I'm forgetting his name right now. Max Dugan from uh, TCU a few years ago was a number five overall guy. But the vast majority, when you go through, it's like flamed out, transferred, stopped playing football after two years, never started a big-time college football program, transferred to a JUCO, wound up playing in NAIA. There's three times as many of those as there are of guys that actually turned out to be that star. So it's, yes, the potential hurts, but I don't look at it like Deuce Knight was this guarantee. Like, I don't look at him going to Clemson and – I mean, the way Clemson is recruiting right now, you figure he's going to be set up for a lot of success. I just didn't have it as being like this knockout, surefire, 100% can't miss prospect like like some did because I think that when you watch him, there is a lot of development that goes into him. I think it was about that skill set, that athletic skill set and that trait set would be unique for Notre Dame to have in the building. And everybody was excited to see what that would look like. Um, so it's, it's, it's frustrating. It's been a long journey. I kind of agree, kind of just glad it's over rather than it lingering over all of us and being kind of awkward and always in the background and all that. Like, I'd rather we all just move on with our lives and do what we're going to do. Albeit, this is very, very frustrating. And the other thing I want to, I want to say is, I don't know what you guys think, but it's kind of a trend now with these Freeman classes of losing the high end guys out of these classes. And I don't know what you do to solve that. You're you're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't. If you go for a bunch of RKGs like John Kennedy's, they all love <laughs> Notre, they all love Notre Dame and they're not going anywhere, but you're also not winning anything. And the flip side is you go after the guys everybody wants, and then everybody's going for them and they're offering them the world, and then you're in a weird spot. So that is a larger scale discussion for Freeman and Chad, how they're gonna be able to try and thread the needle and find guys that are a high level that are going to stick. Um, and that's kind of a bigger picture discussion. Um, is there anything else popping in recruiting right now? Uh, Nathan, I know you, you got the, the flip from the USF commit Antavius Richardson looked like Alabama was sniffing around him. There's some interest there. What else is popping in Notre Dame recruiting? We should know about while we're on that topic anyways. Yeah, well, we'll get into basketball here in a second. I do want to mention just like what, what Nick was talking about with the just the volat the uh, the volatility with with quarterbacks in general. I mean, it, it's not only at the at the college level; it's at the NFL level. I mean, you get busts all the time that are one ones or picked in the top five, top six. So it's like, and just look at who Notre Dame's brought in in the transfer portal the last couple of years. I mean, I know that Sam Hartman wasn't the hit that we thought he was going to be. Riley Leonard so far has kind of been up and down. Obviously, a really good runner, but you know has some work to do as a passer. And I know we're going to get into that later. You know, but those are guys that Notre Dame paid heavy money for. Um, to get out of the transfer portal. And neither of those guys were top recruited players. I mean, obviously you look at where they went out of high school and that kind of tells the story anyway, you know, they were sort of in that three-star range, uh, but they were heavily, heavily, you know, targeted in the portal. And obviously Notre Dame was able to land them. Um, and then the good thing is, and I know you mentioned sort of like Notre Dame's losing sort of like some of their top guys every cycle. I do like that they're in the NIL space now from in in a big way um for, with recruits I, it used to be like okay they're, they're in it for the guys that are on campus already or that they're in it for guys that are in the portal like the riley leonard's and the sam hartman's of the world now it seems like and, and i'll just throw out a good example here i think keon keely if if it was still if if he was a commit in the 2025 class versus the 2023 class or whatever it was, I think he would have remained at Notre Dame because the NIL space was there. What well, wasn't there at the time and it is now. Um, Deuce Knight, obviously completely different story. I don't really think it's about the money. I think it goes back to what Nick said. He's just a kid that's heavily in that, um, you know, that, that not a profile that Notre Dame's going to land on a, on a, you know, on, on a regular basis. Um, but like Dallas Golden, for example, who's a kid committed to Notre Dame right now, who's not leaving this class, same high school as Keon Keeley. They're really, they're really close friends. Berkeley prep, even though it's in the heart of sec country, 
is a very, very big Notre Dame brand in terms of the athletes that go there and the students that go there. A lot of those kids are Notre Dame profiles. Um, so I just wanted to throw that out there. But yeah, getting to Antavius Richardson real quick. This has been kind of said in other spaces, and I and I really agree with it. Obviously, he's a high-level three-star, a four-star, I think, on on three right now. He is the type of kid that Notre Dame and other programs that are in that range of Notre Dame need to land if they're not going to land the five stars at, at a position of like right wide receiver because he is an elite athlete. He's a track star. I think he won the Georgia State Championship in the 400. And then if he didn't win it in the 100 and the 200, he was pretty close and at least won it at his specific level. Um, but I think he had like maybe the actual record for the whole state. Um, in the 400. Um, so obviously some elite speed there. He's not a wide receiver at the high school level. He plays quarterback. He, he's mostly a running quarterback and he plays a little safety and, and corner for his, uh, for his Greenville high school squad. Um, so if you're not going to land the Jeremiah Smiths and the Ryan Williams, who we're seeing run all over the place right now as, as freshmen land these kids who might take a little bit of time, but if they hit, they're going to hit in a big way. And I think that that's maybe what Notre Dame has been missing in some of their classes over the last, you know, decade plus is that, yeah, they've had some three stars and some, so some low level four stars that end up being good players, but are they the elite athlete that can get to, you know, the Georgia Alabama level if they do hit on a higher scale. And I think that's what we're looking at in this Freeman class right now is yes, it's not the, the sexiest class from a ranking standpoint, but if some of these guys, like I said, hit, they are elite level athletes and Antibius Richardson is just another good example of that. And, uh, I gotta, I gotta defer here to you. Notre Dame basketball is on a heater and that's your yeah. arena. That's your specialty baby. So cover the, the basketball, give us the, the, the bright side here. Yeah. I mean, well, I mean, first things first, Jalen Harrelson's the highest ranked recruit that Notre Dame's landed in the modern rankings era. So that tells you everything you need to know. And then honestly, it tells you that if, if, no, if, if Micah Shrewsbury and Notre Dame football or Notre Dame basketball can land a kid that's number 15 in the country from an in-state pro, you know, from an in-state high school, then Notre Dame should be able to do that on a consistent basis as well from a football side of things. So that honestly, it kind of gives me a little bit of hope. There's been some rumors that that Freeman actually played a pretty large role in, in landing Harrelson as well, ironically enough. Um, I, I mean, I think it was really Shrewsbury and then also um, the AAU coach that he hired last year that is now an assistant for him. I forget his name off the top of my head, but um, but yeah, I mean, that that's the big thing. I mean, honestly, if we're looking at their class as a whole, their 2025 recruiting class for, for basketball, the three other kids they landed are, are very on par for what Notre Dame typically lands, at least from like an athletic profile, the rankings, when Mike Bray had his best classes and when he was able to land kids, those were the type of kids he landed. So if he landed a three-man class and you take out Jalen Harrelson, it's still a really good class. It's a bunch of kids that are ranked in like that borderline top 100 right around there. Um, you know, maybe a kid, I think, I think the most recent um, commit, Tommy Anahan um, from a uh, from Minnesota, previously from North Dakota, I think on three ranks him at number 68 or 58, which is obviously pretty high. Um, Brady Kohler, he just took a dip in the rankings for whatever reason, um, but he's in like that right around that top 100 range. And then um, Ryder Frost is like one of the best shooters in the country, which is what Mike Bray was known at landing. And from a profile um, where he, I think he goes to, he's from New Hampshire, Massachusetts originally, uh, played for the same AAU team that like Pat Connaughton played for um, a couple other Notre Dame guys like Cormac Ryan played for them as well. It's middle, uh, middle six um, magic um, out there in like the Northeast region. Um, so in reality, it's a very Notre Dame on par class, but then you add in the high profile guy and Jalen Harrelson. And that's really what takes it over the top. Yeah. Well, it's, it's good to hear that's going good. Good for Shrewsbury getting a lot of, a lot of national run here. People noticing. Um, so Keep us up to date on all the recruiting news here on the, on the hardwood and football and everything else, Nathan. I know you do a good job of that. Mason, too. You guys are all over that recruiting 247. I really appreciate it. Um, let's bring it back to back to football here. We're on the break. <laughs> Notre Dame's 4-1. and one. You got two ranked wins. To go along with one of the most embarrassing losses in America and in Notre Dame football history, Nick... How do you even begin to wrap your mind around what we've seen this first half of the season for Notre Dame? There's a lot of extremes going on here. Where's your, where's the, the reality here? 
I mean, I think you look at it and what it has to be is this is this team is telling you what it is. No one else in the country can say that they have two wins over top 25 teams right now. Notre Dame can. That's a sign of a really good program, really good team, one that's capable of some some great things. Also, how many Power 5 programs can say they lost at home to a Northern Illinois? Ah, uh, yeah. It's it's going to be, it has been and it's going to be a week by week season for this Notre Dame team. And so far, since taking care of Purdue the week after Northern Illinois, Notre Dame, although not pretty at times, not pretty in large chunks, see that Miami-Ohio game, um, see parts offensively against Louisville this past week, although those have taken place, it still shows signs of being a really good football team. Okay, I look at it. Notre Dame, you went into this year knowing that unless something absolutely crazy happened, this wasn't a team that was going to be able to compete with like what Ohio State has as a roster. What Texas probably has as a roster, what Georgia has as a roster in Alabama. Outside of those teams, I mean, Ole Miss is a top 10 team. Ole Miss is losing at home to Kentucky. You think Notre Dame can't play with Ole Miss? I sure as heck think they can. Missouri sits in the top 10. Anything you've seen from Missouri so far that says Notre Dame can't play with them? You look in the Big Ten, and Drew Eller at quarterback for Penn State, Looked like, oh my God, his first half against West Virginia. This is a changed man. This is different. Penn State hasn't exactly been overly impressive, um, even though they're sitting in good position right now. You look at uh, the rest of the Big Ten, Oregon, despite being undefeated so far, hasn't looked overly impressive for large parts of this season. And you kind of look and you're like, wow. So Notre Dame, probably not a national championship contender, but right in the thick of a college football playoff race. Oh, pretty much exactly what we all said all summer long. It's just that this team, you're you're limited in what you're going to be able to do passing the ball, which means unless you are absolutely destroying people up front like you saw against Purdue, you're not going to win a lot of games like 40 to 7. You're going to be in, in games that might not be coming down to the wire, but are close towards the end, and there's going to be an uneasiness for a lot of it. Well, that's Notre Dame football in 2024. That's just the way this team is constructed and built right now. It doesn't mean that it still can't reach some very high goals. That's very well stated. Nathan, what do you, what do you think uh, of this kind of uneven, not sure what you're going to see every week. Can I trust this team? Like, what do you make of this start? Honestly, I think it's just a lot of same old, same old, like Nick, Nick kind of got into it a little bit, but outside of like the Alabama's Ohio States and Georgia's of the world, you're going to have these teams that on any given week can lose to pretty much anybody. Now, obviously, you never want to lose to Northern Illinois at home, and that's something that Freeman needs to figure out as a head coach because it happened against Marshall in his first year. Now it's happening again against Northern Illinois. Um, what you want to see Notre Dame do against a MAC team is when they don't necessarily play their best football, they go out and beat them 28 to three, like they did to Miami of Ohio a few weeks back. That's, that's exactly what they should have done to Northern Illinois. Um, and Northern Illinois has now lost two times since now, again, one of them's against NC state. So, you know, you expect them to lose to that, that kind of program as well. Um, but you don't expect them to lose to Buffalo. So that, that's where a lot of this uneasiness I think comes from, but in general, I think Nick really put it put it, you know, delicately is, you know, that's, you know, Notre Dame's, you know, they're, they're a really good football program. They're, they have a really good chance of going undefeated the rest of the way, especially considering their schedule. And if they, you know, if they mess up once, maybe even twice, it wouldn't surprise anybody. Um, But at the same time, like they should be favored and they should be, um, you know, maybe not at USC, I guess, depending on how USC does the rest of the way, but they should be favored or in every game. Um, the rest of the way. And um, a lot of that's going to happen because the defense is so talented, even with some of the injuries there. Um, And then obviously I think as the season goes on, you're going to see some improvement out of, I think we've already seen the improvement in in a sense. I mean, I think Riley Leonard's been, I'm not a Riley defender by any means, but I do think he has been much better than people are giving him credit for the last couple of weeks. I don't really blame him at all for the, the stallness that they had this past week against, uh, who the hell they play? <laughs> the hell they play with Louisville? Um, yeah, I, I, I thought like I think it was an indictment on maybe how the coaches feel about him in a sense. But when I thought when he was given opportunities against Louisville, he actually played pretty well. And then I think in sort of the middle part of that game, he wasn't given opportunities to do much. And there's some rumors that maybe he got injured again. I know we saw him 
get the air knocked out of them or the wind knocked out of them or whatever. But, but yeah, no, I mean, in general, I, I, I think this is just a really good program that is, is going to make you <laughs> bite your nails sometimes while you're watching them, but they're going to come out on top the majority of the time. And you, you kind of alluded to it and this has been on my mind since we've been in the break now, you know, Notre Dame's looking at probably, I would say near a dozen frontline contributors on either side of the ball, either starters or rotational guys that are now injured, many of them down for the year. The offensive line's decimated when it comes to this. And defensively, you had series out there with the Louisville game in doubt, a must-win game. And there were periods where Notre Dame had four true freshmen out there playing defense in a must-have a game against an undefeated top 15 team. That's just where we're at injury-wise. Nick, does this vast amount of injury change your outlook for the second half of the season or what you think is possible here for Notre Dame? Or are you saying next man up, everybody's banged up, you got to do what you got to do? Or are you really having to like reconfigure in your mind what you think the levels for this team could be? Is there an amount of injuries that's just too much to overcome with youth and and you're just in a bad spot? How do you look at this in, this rash of injuries? I mean, I, I think you look at it, and yes, there is a point where it gets to that. But I think this speaks to the what we've heard for multiple years now, multiple recruiting classes here with Notre Dame and under Marcus Freeman, is that, wow, you're recruiting and the depth is getting better. Like, let's go back to 2018, how that season ended in the Cotton Bowl against uh, against Clemson. Blowout loss, what was it, 30-3. to three. That game was was dead even until what happened? Julian Love gets suffers the injury. He yep. goes out. I won't say the guy's name because I don't want to bury him. But as soon as he comes on the <laughs> field, he gets targeted. Clemson's offense erupts. That game's yep. over. Great Notre coaching, Dame, by the way. Great, well, great coaching by Clemson on Clemson's side to target right the, away. It, right, that is grade A great coaching to do what they did. They knew the weakness, targeted it, and it blew the game open. Good job by Dabo on that one. Yeah, but I mean, you look at that, and that spoke to a Notre Dame team that roster wise, all right, one through 40, 45, probably pretty strong, but the back half of that roster was not anywhere near what Clemson was offering couldn't step in and, and fill holes like that. And, and listen, Julian Love was an All-American. What he's done in the NFL shows that him getting drafted, what was it, the third or fourth round, probably a steal for the Giants after at, for the years they got at him before he signed with Seattle. But that's besides the point. This is a team in Notre Dame right now that you're seeing the bottom half of the classes be at a higher level than they were for the longest time. Maybe you're still swinging and missing on Deuce Knight. You're still swinging and missing on Keon Keeley, on Peyton Bowen, whoever it might be. But overall, you're hitting on a lot more of that. Your floor is a lot higher in this, and what that's doing is it's building a depth. I don't look at it and think that Notre Dame right now has reached that number where it's like, yep, this is too many injuries to overcome. Again, that's not to say that can't happen, but I mean, you had to have liked what you saw against Louisville when you had Bryce Young on the field, when you had, I mean, KVA on the field making yep. plays again. Yep. Logan you have Thomas impact freshmen, and, and they're taking advantage of the opportunity, not just running like a deer in headlights away from the big lights. Nathan, what do you make of this, man? Does all those injuries make you recalibrate and be like, man, we're getting thin. What's this going to do to the back half of a stretch of games? Or is it next man up, Notre Dame starting to build some depth? Let's go. The one injury that really, really bothers me is the Bubakar Triori injury. And obviously, we don't know 100% if it's season ending yet. Uh, but Dude, I, it he was like cranking it, it up, man. He was turning yeah. it up. He was coming into his own, finding a role, creating a niche, getting heat, getting credit, making plays, getting noticed. Everything you could ask him to do, he was doing. And then right when it was about to peak, the turf monster. Yeah, he was really starting to feel like the best pass rusher they've had, I would say, even prior to Julian Aquara. Um and, and those guys like Khalid Kareem. So, I mean, maybe even back to like the Stefan Tuit days. Um, in all honesty, I mean, that's really how like, I, I think he's a first round talent. I really do. And so like, he, it's, it sucks losing him. Obviously, Patello, I mean, now you're, now you're down to, 
your third string in a sense, uh, Viper. It's good that they're going to get Joshua Burnham back, even though he's more of a strong side guy. Um, but it goes back to what Nick said. I mean, they have so much more depth now than than what they used to have. And I actually want to point out something Nick brought up. I mean, for as good as Julian Love was and that the top half of that roster was for Notre Dame, I mean, you can make an argument that for a better football team, he should have been a safety like he is in the NFL. And so he was a, he was a, obviously a dominant college cornerback at Notre Dame. But imagine if he was able to play safety at Notre Dame when he's a Pro Bowl safety in the NFL. And, and now I think if he was recruited – in today's football, he probably would be a safety at Notre Dame. So, I mean, I think that just even tells you even further what Mike Mickens specifically has done on the back end because I sometimes I was talking to Mason about this a few weeks ago. Imagine a, imagine a backfield right now, a defensive backfield where you have Ben Morrison, Cam Hart, Kyle Hamilton, and like Julian Love back there. And then you have Xavier Watts, obviously, who's just won the Nagurski award the previous year. I mean, those, that's some, that's some crazy stuff. I mean, Julian Love would have been a really good nickel cornerback in a safety for Notre Dame, but I don't want to get too off of, off topic. It's just something that kind of got brought to my mind when, when Nick was talking. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, I think you don't want too many more, obviously you don't want too many more injuries, but I, I, I do think that they can sustain some success. Um, they, I, I love the freshmen. Like you mentioned, John, they had like four freshmen on the field at one time. I think Leonard Moore is honestly better than Jaden Mickey. And I think that's a reason why Jaden Mickey, Mickey said he was entering the portal and that's no slight to Mickey. I think he's going to end up going to a pretty good power five program and, and finding some success. And he would have been successful at Notre Dame if he stayed. Um, but, but I think Leonard Moore was starting to sort of inch closer to beating him on the depth chart. And, and, and Mickey saw the writing on the wall. And then you have guys like, I mean, I was thinking about this during the game this past weekend, you know, it, when uh, Triori went down, I'm like, man, Bryce Young right there, five, five-star defensive end, five-star defensive ends as freshmen should get on the field and play. And the only reason he wasn't getting on the field on a regular basis was because they have, because they had Botello, because they had Triore. And then obviously I know RJ Oban hasn't really lived up to the portal hype that he brought in, but you did have a 60 year guy in RJ Oban and you had, you know, Joshua Burnham before the injury was there as well. Um, junior Tuliamaka has been on campus for a long time. And it looks like he's sort of stepping up in a big way. The last two weeks, he's been much better. Um, I think over the last two weeks when he's been asked. So, I mean, there's definitely some guys there. I mean, I think even, I think it's even a testament to someone like, um, uh, who's the other freshman? Thomas, um, who a little, little bit thinner, um, but obviously a very high profile kid um, out of Texas who transferred to Ohio for his, his senior year of high school. Uh, L- Logan Thomas was a guy that was coveted by a lot of programs and and someone that's very twitchy, very athletic. He doesn't really look like a defensive end right now, but if you put him in there in certain spots, third down, third and long, he's going to be able to get to the quarterback because he's so fast. And um, so they have way more depth just looking at it from that perspective than they've had in previous years. Yeah. You guys are making me feel better about it. Thank you. I pre I needed that. Um, <laughs> at I least wonder- on defense. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I'm glad you brought that up because I want to circle back a little bit to the offensive side of the ball. I believe this offense is a little bit frustrating at times for everybody involved. Like sometimes it hums along fine. Other times it's like pulling teeth to be able to, (coughs) it looks like you got a reconfigured wide receiver room trying to find its footing. You have a quarterback that missed all the spring and then is in here trying to do what he could do. You got a play caller that's trying to figure out what he could run with the new group. And, oh, by the way, you got an offensive line decimated with injuries trying to just find its footing as well. Nick, what do you make of this Notre Dame offense right now? And, And the question I have specifically is, do you have anything that gives you confidence the second half, even in the midst of all their battling, that they could get incrementally better and better and better as, as we go along? Or is there just too many offensive line problems and it's just going to be a struggle every week? I mean, I think part of it, when you hear the term complimentary football, I think people don't understand what the hell they're talking about when they say that. Like they hear it and they're like, oh, yeah well, a great punt, and then it helps the defense out because they're backed up deep and the defense can give up more. Yeah, that's part of it. But it's also like goes into play calling and what you do when you're in control of a game. I thought you saw that with Marcus Freeman, even though the game 
against Texas A&M was, was one score the entire time. I thought that that was like a great example of like complimentary football of don't let the offense cost this. Don't put Riley Leonard in a position where he's going to make a mistake and give Texas A&M the ball in a short field. Okay, statistically, the numbers kind of stink in this game in terms of yardage, in terms of drives, in terms of points. But do enough to change field position a little bit, but don't risk the game in order for that big play because you have a defense you can rely on to do a lot of things. I think you saw that Saturday. There's this eruption after the game, and I'm not talking about you necessarily, John. You had a little bit of it in your show, but just kind of going around, checking out the the Notre Dame postgame platforms after I got done with my writing, and it's like, did, did Notre Dame lose by 10? What the hell happened? Like, yeah, I watched the game too. And yes, and I know Nathan talked about it a little bit ago. We, we, we mentioned it a little. There's the lapses in that Louisville game offensively. Notre Dame, when you look up, I think the most important stats in that game, Notre Dame led the contest for 49 minutes and 59 seconds. And of those 49 minutes and 59 seconds, it was something like 38 of them was a two-possession game. Notre Dame, they, oh, they're not putting Louisville away. They're not doing – Notre Dame's trusting their best unit to win and secure this game. That's the defense, and yes, there were parts there where it didn't play its best, but it came out in the second half and it balled out. Three and out, three and out. Maybe one or two first downs, the first three or four drives for Louisville, but they weren't threatening to score. And when the defense is playing at that level, all right, you have a lead – play with the lead, do something safe, don't have a mess-up situation where you turn the ball over because of a stupid play call and a stupid decision on an interception like you did against Northern Illinois that turns the whole direction of the game. I mean, I think it speaks to that largely, and you might not like it, but you better get used to it for the final seven games of the season because that's Notre Dame. Like I said, unless you're playing a Purdue team that is one awful two quits in the first quarter, you're not going to light up the scoreboard. This is not just on a team that's built to do that. And so you better get used to some of this. Grind it out, not always going to be pretty. Fantasy football players probably going to hate Notre Dame based on what this is, but it's just playing to win a game versus playing to pad a stat sheet. Yeah, it's a good point. It's a good point, but I, Nick, people are mad when they see you can say you're mad. You don't have to say your callers are mad. You can say you're <laughs> I'm always okay. mad. Why do I got to announce I'm mad? I'm always mad. It's just a matter of what I'm mad at. Fine, Cole I'm came mad. Up today and the wind was blowing out of the east instead of the west. <laughs> Damn it, I'm mad. I'm John Kennedy. <laughs> Nick, Nick, you understand, though, how this fan base is going to react when they see yardage by quarter and it's like 170 something in the first quarter for Notre Dame and each quarter you know, it. That's it, my goes to all of them. It, it goes down it was it was 40 yards and then in the third quarter 17 yards no one likes to see your offense I, get worse the longer the game goes along Nick I get it I get it but also like I don't want to be stats nerd here either However, but if you're watching like the win probability, and if you're watching playoff baseball, you can't help but have it shoved down your throat in the corner these days of like every pitch that changes. Oh, it's oh now Houston has a 61% chance of winning because that was a strike instead of 60% yeah. a second ago. Like, just get that off my screen. I can tell that each out in a playoff game is big and important. Like, get that the hell out of here. But if you're following that during the game last week, you're seeing okay, Notre Dame. Stumbles on their drive. Okay, Notre Dame doesn't put points on, but you're seeing like the chances of victory increase, increase, increase the entire time. It's like you're playing to win the game. You're not yeah, playing wait, to satisfy some wait, dumbass wait, fantasy wait, team. Wait, 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 no. You're right. But if you I were know playing, I'm right. But but wait, <laughs> but if you were playing good offense and scoring more, the win probability would go up even it's more. It's not a strength. So but don't he, play to your weaknesses. Play to your strengths. Don't mess up. Don't put yourself in position to blow something offensively and let Louisville back in the game for the most part that despite what the stats are saying, you're in total control of. That's fine. There's a difference between winning a box score and winning in a final score. Like, I get it. 
Like you can wish for this. I can wish to go stand out in the wind and spit into it and it'll spit not to come fly back in my face. But guess what? It's going to happen if I do something stupid. Why put yourself in position offensively to do something stupid like that? Like it's credit to Notre Dame for doing that. Like I don't risk it. Yeah. Let your defense, your safest part of your team, go and make plays and win the game for you. And that's what it did. What a mature perspective. I'm telling you what, that is like, that is more mature than I'm capable of being. And we will, next time we get a lead, seven, nothing, three, nothing, whatever, we'll take a knee and punt every time from now on to make you happy so we don't make any mistakes and we'll just play our defense and we'll, we'll get out of there. But that's what it was, Nick. People saw that offensive thing get worse and worse and they got more and more mad. Uh, Nathan, what do you make of this? Like what... Is there anything that gives you hope? You mentioned like Riley Leonard, maybe feeling a little better about him coming around. What gives you a little hope, even with the offensive line problems we have, that, that this offense can find a little something to build on in the second half? Give me something. You got anything? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I think first and foremost, we need to remember that Louisville is a good team. And yeah. that, that like kind of like what Nick was getting to a little bit, it, it kind of bothered me at the end of that game, regardless of like, like you said, John, like how the offense just went through a complete lull for essentially two quarters um, or longer. But I think this idea that they were playing Northern Illinois or Miami of Ohio again is just something that people need to brush kind of just get out of their memory at this point. Cause Louisville, I mean, they, we could talk all day about Notre Dame showing up for the big games, not showing up for the Mac games, all that kind of stuff, whatever it may be. But when you beat a team as good as this Louisville team, and honestly, I thought they played very well outside of a few turnovers, um, you know, in that game. I mean, I mean, Tyler Shuck played the best game I've ever seen. I feel like I, yeah. I was not, he made some, I, I don't know if he's an NFL quarterback. I know he's 25, so probably not. But there was some throws he made in that game and some catches that were made in that game by the Louisville receivers that I don't think could be repeated if they played again. And so take away the Notre Dame fumble at the start of the game, take away the Jadarian Price fumble, which I think that might have been his first fumble in a Notre Dame uniform, if I'm not mistaken, or at least first lost fumble. Um, and... You know, th those are the things I think they need to clean up more so than the offense needs to get better. Um, in reality, obviously, we want the offense to continue to progress. I think getting Billy Strauss back on the offensive line is going to help a lot because as much as I want the story of Rocco Spindler to be there, I think Billy Strauss is just a better player. Um, and, and and getting him back is going to be is going to be nice. Um, I, Coogan, I think, is a good player. He's not as athletic as Ashton Craig, but I think he's going to be perfectly fine at center. I'm not really worried there. And I think as the tackles continue to progress as they're as first year starters, um, obviously you, you hated losing Jag uh, Jagusa or Jagasa before the uh, before the season started, but I think An Anthony Knapp and and Emil Wagner have actually looked pretty good, and they're just going to get better and better as the year goes on. Um, the the two things I didn't like in the game that. That I, and I think we've actually talked about this sort of in our SI group chat a little bit. The uh, the fourth down play that they didn't get when they ran Leonard, I think it was like two times in a row. I think at some point, even if you don't necessarily trust the kid, you got to do something different because it's honestly it's go at 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 this point we're we're four game five games in at this point it's going to be something that the defense that you're playing against is not prepared for because everybody knows when Notre Dame's on third and short or fourth and short and they really need to pick up that first down it's going to be a QB draw or an RPO where Leonard most likely keeps it and honestly in Denbrock's defense he's going to pick it up most of the time because he's big He's athletic. He's hard to take down unless you get hands on him in the backfield immediately. Um, and if you get any sort of push on the offensive line, he's probably going to get it, whether it's fourth and two, fourth and three, whatever. So I, I get it. But at the same time, at some point, just, just a little something different. Actually, he did something. I think it was on the first drive of the game where they did the little out route to, um, to Jaden Thomas. Almost immediately after, I think I was on the third down, Bo Collins, they almost ran the same play and he just dropped the ball. And that's why they were even on fourth down to begin with. So maybe you don't have to pass. Maybe you do something where you run it with Jadarian Price or, or Jeremiah Love. But a little creativity there on, on the short down distances, I think, can be something that Notre Dame can take advantage of moving forward. 
and then I, I, didn't, I didn't really like the idea of benching a, a really good player for you because of one mistake. I mean, I, it sucks. I know they did it to Audrey Gastamay a couple of years ago that I got reminded of um, when, when, uh, when I tweeted about it or whatever. But because the fact that the Notre Dame offense is sort of, you know, iffy at times, I don't like taking a guy that I think is an NFL player potentially next year off the field in situations where he can, you know, he can maybe break one. And he had one early. I think it was, I forgot what drive it was. It might've been like the second or third drive of the game before the fumble happened. He had a big play right before they hit. I think, yeah, I think it was the second, the second touchdown possession. He had a, he had a big like 15 or 20 yard run right before uh, Jane Greathouse um, got wide open in the slot for the touchdown. So he's a guy that, Um, And I think credit to Tim O'Malley over at Irish Illustrated for this on his podcast. He mentioned that um, Price is sort of one of those guys that's either going to hit the big one or it's going to be stuffed. And or at least so far this year, that's kind of been the case. He has like 11 big plays and like a let like everything else has been like for low yardage or negative yardage. But those guys are the dynamic players. I mean, that, like, look at Derrick Henry in the NFL. He goes for he goes twenty for two hundred, and like ten of those runs are for like one yard or less. But then he breaks one for fifty, and I think that's kind of what Jadarian Price is. And um, when you can do that at any point in time in the game, I don't like taking that guy out unless for whatever reason his confidence is just completely shot after the fumble, and we don't. That's the kind of stuff we're not privy to. Uh, but it seems like it's an mo for Marcus Freeman and his staff to pull guys uh, when stuff like that happens because they did it with Devin Ford as well um, after the kickoff. And you know, if, if he's someone you trust on kickoffs, then or at least on kick returns, like, why are you pulling a, a guy who's like a sixth year senior um, when that happens? So again, I'm not a coach. I'm not going to pretend to be an uh, you know a college football coach. But that's just something that I wish they maybe didn't do, especially with a, a such a big name player like Jadarian Price in their offense. Yeah, I think I think that makes sense. I see that cutting both ways. Um, <clears throat> so as we kind of start to kind of round third here on this episode, I got to ask something maybe kind of tough here, you guys. You know, I know entering this year when we're in August, uh, we're looking at camp where everybody's excited. You're making your season predictions. I think everybody, I. I I don't want to speak for everybody, but I think everybody I remember in this niche was saying, you know, a successful season for Notre Dame is you at least got to make this expanded playoff field. Uh, There were some people even went a little bit further wanting a a first round win uh, to be counting as a successful season. Now you got a couple really good wins. You got one really bad loss. Nick, is that still the standard for Notre Dame this year is to get into this playoff or are you waffling on that? Or has it changed a little bit as you see the injuries or inefficiencies on this team? Is that still the standard? I mean, there's injuries, but it's not like, it's not like we're playing NCAA football for PlayStation and that we toggle injuries on for Notre Dame and everybody else doesn't have them, you know, like I still look at this and Oh, big, bad, mighty Georgia Tech's coming up on the schedule in a couple of weeks. It was so scary because they beat Florida State. Well, Florida State sucks. Florida State's a disaster. And that's a team that you're seeing it week by week. Okay, they beat Cal, but that's a team that has full of transfers that came there with one intention to win the ACC, to go to the college football playoff and try to win a national championship. That's done, and you're, like, watching that team last week, especially if you saw any of that. You watched that team pull up Purdue, and they just quit against SMU in the second half. And so can they put it all together for a full game at Notre Dame? Sure. I mean, this schedule is still, even with the disastrous loss on there, even with the injuries loading up for this Notre Dame team, it is still extremely favorable. USC has a better off, a better defense than they've had in years, which they've needed. However, like you look at efficiency rankings, that offense isn't exactly lighting up the room um, as much as you might want to think it is under Lincoln Riley. Like every game on this schedule, even with the shortcomings of this offense, even with some of the limitations that this team might have, every game is extremely winnable. And I don't know what the line is necessarily going to say at USC, but I mean, at worst, I think that one's a toss up in this. So yes, my expectation, my expectation for this team was to, was to go at least 11 and one and host a playoff game, win a playoff game and whoever, whatever happens after that's kind of an added bonus. I think it's even in going 11 to one, it's going to be very difficult to, to host a playoff game with this because of what that loss happens to be. But I mean, depending on your draw, 
you could still play. Say you're an eight seed, a nine seed. You still might be playing, you know, second place from the Big 12, second place from the ACC in a game that, all right, you might have to go on the road for it, but you're playing in a matchup that you can, you have all the horses to be able to play with and potentially win a playoff game in this. So my expectation still is at least make the field. Yes. Nick, let me ask you this before Nathan jumps in. Is there any space or chance for a 10 and two Notre Dame in this 12 teamer with the one loss being to NIU? Like, I don't know if that's in the cards. It may be some year, but I don't think it could be this year with that one loss being what it is. I would, I would lean to say probably not, but if all hell breaks loose and say like Alabama goes on, dominates and wins the SEC undefeated and you have a bunch of two, three lost teams there, there's a scenario where it can happen, but I think you got to take care of your own business and play it the yeah. safe way and just go 11 and one. Man, you you could go eleven and one. It just couldn't be that one. <laughs> like yeah. you could go eleven and one, but it couldn't be that one. Uh, I mean, Nate, imagine if that one right now is a close loss against A and M instead of yeah. NIU, and you're sitting okay. There's there's room to lose one more. I I just don't I actually that. have a right different now. approach to that. Okay, I, great. Let's hear it. I I think ten and two with an NIU loss kills you. I think eleven and one. With NIU being your only loss, people chalk that up to like, okay, you guys just had a really, really crappy day. I would rather have the AM win on my schedule. I'd rather have the Louisville win and the USC win on the road on my schedule and maybe a couple of these other teams if they end up staying in the, um, you know, in like that top, you know, 25, 30 range or whatever. Um, it's not, net, I mean, it sucks because when you lose the NIU and you go, if you, if you potentially go 11 and one, you're like, well, crap, we should have gone 12 and 0. We should be the number five seed hosting the playoff and whatever. But for, but ironically, I just, I, there's, there's a weird part of me that thinks 11 and one with NIU, especially if you like dominate some of these games and like, let's just say uh, USC is able to, you know, win a few of these games in the in the Big Ten. I mean, I know they had that that game against Michigan that they probably should have won and, and blew at the end. Uh, but like Nick said, I mean, the USC is kind of the same old, same old. And honestly, they just have a worse quarterback. Um, there was a lot of talk that Miller Moss was going to be better for USC because he's going to play Lincoln Riley's offense. But I think when you lose a guy like Caleb Williams, we all saw what he did to Notre Dame at USC two years ago. Um, and then USC was just a dumpster fire last year. And like, I know he had a bad game, but it's hard to really blame it on him, um, with how talented he is overall. But, but yeah, I mean, I, I think USC is arguably an easier opponent this year than last year, just because of, I mean, like, again, Nick said they have the better defense and it's a road game. So, I mean, maybe I'm just kind of talking out of my ass here, but in general, I just think that it, it, they don't scare me as much. Uh, right now because there's still going to be a team that if you can dominate the trenches you're gonna you're gonna have a find a way find a way to win and I just don't think they're gonna have much of an answer for Jeremiah Love, Jadarian Price, Riley Leonard on the ground, especially when Notre Dame's in their 12th game of the season versus their, you know, versus like their fourth or fifth. Um but yeah, um and then I think with with Marcus Freeman team specifically, there's something to be said about them playing on the road for for whatever reason. Um, you know, they don't always, I mean, obviously Louisville, good example last year, they got hammered by Louisville last year, but they, they seem to bring a different edge about them, um, on the road. I think Texas A&M is a really good example of that. I think even Ohio state, the game they lost a few years back is a good example of that. Cause that team wasn't very good. Cause they lost to Marshall the next, the next game lost at home to Stanford, lost to got, uh, I mean, they beat Clemson that year, but I forgot who else they lost to that year. Like, what's, uh, or was it just those three? I don't remember. Whatever. I, I try not to remember those. That was some of those years. <laughs> but, uh, but in general, like, I it just seems under Freeman they they have this different edge about them on the road. And I know December possible snow, really really cold at at Notre Dame Stadium probably gives Notre Dame the advantage, especially if they're playing somewhere somewhere from Texas or or the South or someone like that, um, or even the West Coast, but. Like Nick said, if they're playing, you know, or was it one of you said if if they're playing like the second best Big Twelve team or the or you know whoever like if someone in the ACC potentially or or whatever it may be as their first game and it's on the road, it's not something I'm like really scared of because you know you see what they did at A and M. I know A and M's not amazing by any means, but they're not going to be in a in a more hostile environment than that in the playoff until they maybe get to some of those uh, harder opponents. And, and at, at, by that point in time, 
you're looking at neutral site games anyway. Yeah, it's uh man, it's going to be interesting. I think I think where I fall on all this is Notre Dame is not in the position to look ahead. And so I agree. I just think it is a week to week thing. Every and, situation is its own dynamic. Do whatever you got to do, scratch and claw out these wins, keep collecting them and move on to the next. You know, each game's going to create its own challenges and and everything. That's about the best you could do if you're Notre Dame in the position they're in now. Um as we wrap this up, I want to give you each an opportunity. Is there anything I've missed, haven't hit on, you wanted to hit on, or any final uh, parting shots you want to depart with here? I give you each the opportunity. I mean, my only one is this is a good football team. I wrote about it this week. Like, you just beat a very good Louisville team, one that might challenge 10, 11, yeah, probably 10 wins on the year and could be playing for an ACC championship game. Like, enjoy it. You ask for these, you beg for these 12 Saturdays a year, you get it. I don't know. Maybe it's late nineties, early two thousands. Me that's coming out and remember some of those just dump Davy years and the struggles of Tyrone Willingham and how frustrating some of that was and disasters under Charlie Weiss, but you only get 12 of them. You have a team that is probably a top 10 team in college football when it's all said and done or has the potential to be that enjoy it just a little bit. You don't have to just complain and moan about every single thing. Like this is a solid football team that has flaws that aren't always, aren't always going to let it be the sexiest of football teams, but this is a good football team. And it's showing us that on a weekly basis outside of that disaster against NIU. You muted on yourself. <laughs> My bad. I was coughing. So I had to make sure uh, I would just say, like this is a good time for the bye week um, because of injuries that we talked about. I think because we can sort of get Northern Illinois a little bit more past us. After, and I think people might appreciate the Louisville win two weeks from now, more so than, than, you know, just like right after the game, um, you know, hopefully you get a guy like Joshua Burnham back then. I think he was suited up, you know, for the, for the last game, but didn't really play Christian Gray should be back on defense. So you, that's the one thing you want to keep that defense stellar. And you already lost a few guys, but you don't want to lose too much more because that defense needs to remain um, elite because that's really the reason this program or this team specifically can stay really, really good like Nick is talking about um, because they can win games lower scoring. Um, and then on top of that, like I said, just the idea that you can sort of move past some of like that NIU loss a little bit as a fan base, um, as a coaching staff, stuff like that, and really focus on a week to week basis moving forward and, and kind of go from there. So I think the bye week comes at a good time, even though you're not necessarily playing an opponent that you care about coming off the bye week. Yeah, I, uh, man, I, I agree with a, a lot of these points and, um, you know, one more thing for me as, as we wrap up here is, uh, I just, I want to thank on behalf of these guys too. I want to thank everybody, you know, in the Notre Dame circle here, that's, that's checked us out since we've moved into this SI platform. Um, you know, September was, a uh, it, you know, getting in the games, we're doing the best we can, little trial and error, getting things going, seeing what's working and hitting our stride. A lot of you guys have been uh, pulling our articles up, giving it a shot, giving it a read. We really appreciate that support. And uh, everybody here tries to work hard and have different angles. We bring to the table different areas of specialties that, that we're good at riding on, whatever. We have a really good team and we appreciate everybody giving us a shot giving us a read and uh, looking us up whenever anything in Notre Dame land breaks. So we really appreciate a strong first month from the Notre Dame, uh, the Notre Dame football faithful and all you guys checking us out. Um, so you need to do so read everything from these guys and Mason Plummer as well in our circle. Um, and every single day we're going to have something for you. So stay tuned everybody. And thanks for being here. Take care.